I want to also share, look, tonight we, um, we have the unique and very special privilege of having among us and with us Project Hope. Uh, y'all give them a hand. Some of you are going, well, who are they? Well, you're about to find out. Uh, but Brother Rico, uh, who oversees this ministry here in our community, is going to be sharing tonight. Um, and so I, I want to make sure we give him the time. But I also want to just draw attention. You know, there's a table. Some of you saw it coming in. You're like, what's all this stuff? This is nice. What's Has the church moved into a new business? No, that's Project Hope. And uh, if, you, if, there are Chris, if there's Christmas shopping that you need to do or, you know, birthday shopping, whatever, there's a table back here. Uh, all, all that which you uh, purchase um, goes to this ministry. And, uh, and also tonight, I'm going to have the ushers, um, y'all be listening, ushers, at the conclusion. They're going to be standing in the back. And if you would like to just sow into this ministry, you're about to hear what this ministry is about and how awesome the work of God is in it. And now a lot of these men come and join us on Saturday nights, and you may not even know who they were and what they're about, but yet again, you're, you're, you're going to find out tonight. I know that there's not a single person, listen to me carefully, there is not a single person in this room who has not been directly or indirectly impacted by the stronghold of drug addiction and alcohol addiction. There are some that's a very personal and very direct influence in your life and has been the source of a lot of torment there are others of us who know people friends children sons daughters of friends that have been tormented by this stronghold but I'm here to announce and you're going to hear it firsthand tonight that Jesus has come to set everyone free If you don't believe me, well, you will after tonight's over with. So I want, if you would, to just give a hand to uh, Brother Rico as he comes from Project Hope tonight. Y'all, let's just bless and honor this man of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you guys for having me. You guys are awesome. I don't know uh, any other church that's rocking out on Saturday night. Um, you guys are on a live bunch, and that's awesome. Thank you for, for lead, listening to the lead of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you could play that video, I'm just going to play a quick video that kind of just gives a snapshot of our program and what we do, and then we'll go from there. mission here at Project Hope is to see men and women's lives transform. The one major key to this transformation is the daily structure that's provided. Every morning is started with time in the Word of God doing group proverbs and prayer. This is the foundation of the recovery and walk with Christ. The students then have class where they are led in biblical devotions and group studies for new Christians. Throughout their 12-month program, they will have committed to memory over 50 different scriptures from the Bible. They will go through such classes as, How Can I Know I'm a Christian, Obedience to God, and Growing Through Failure. During the afternoon, the women head to the craft shop. The women sort through and organize all of the necklaces, bracelets, rings, and smaller craft items in preparation for the weekend fundraiser. The men head over to the wood shop where they handcraft over 1,000 crosses each week as well as plaques and specialty items. This not only serves as a vocation and teaching of good work ethic, but this is also the primary means in which the program is funded. Over the weekend, our senior students and staff members head out to stores that we've partnered with such as Walmart, Sam's Club, and Tractor Supply. Yes, it is our goal to raise money, 
but this is also our number one way of getting people into the program that need help. Over 60% of our students have heard about Project Hope from our fundraising efforts. The daily structure of the program is set up to provide a positive change in one's life. However, it's because we are Christ-centered that we see such successful results in those that finish the program. Our goal is for every individual to develop a personal relationship with Jesus, and it is that which will not only set you free, but keep you free. Rex, if you could come up. Um, here in Fort Walton, we operate, um, Project Hope operates a men's and women's center in Houston, and that was that video. But we, uh, in 2016, opened up at the old waterfront, and we operate a 28-bed men's facility here. Um, Rex is a graduate of our program. He now serves as our, uh, yeah. Our program is not easy, y'all. It's a year-long commitment. Um, they bas basically give up everything um, for a whole year. We tell them when to eat, when to sleep, when to wake up, um, when to pray. Um, it's, it's tough. Um, and, uh, you know, for those that are, are ready to, to totally surrender and allow God to do a work in their lives, um, it, it, uh, we, we see great miracles. Uh, Rex completed. He now actually serves as our house manager and helping to see others set free. So I'm a let him share a little bit of his story. Um, as Brother Rico said, my name is Rex. I'm, uh, I'm, I'll be 34 years old January 1st. Um, I suffered from severe drug addiction for about 17 years. Um, I started using when I was about 15, and, and it was just crazy. My whole life was just a series of train wrecks. Um, my father is a, a hardcore addict. He introduced me to drugs. Um, he introduced me to that lifestyle, and uh, uh, it was a it was a bad road that I went down. But uh, I've had heart surgery twice, surgery on my spleen. I lost three fingers. All of that was a result of my IV drug addiction. I've had a stroke. Um, there's been a couple of times where I was in the hospital and. Uh, Doctors told my mother that I wasn't going to make it, but uh, how many of you know that we serve a greater God than any, anything that a doctor can say? He's got a plan, and uh, you know, I came to Project Hope because I didn't have structure in my life. I didn't know what a godly life looked like, and uh, this program, they blessed me with an opportunity. They took me in. Nobody else would give me a chance, um, and I took it and ran with it, man, and uh, I have the honor of working with men and women that have been set free from the same struggles that I had, and I, I also have the honor of seeing these guys get set free. It is amazing. It is an amazing program, and it's, uh, it's all to the glory of God. It's nothing, that, the only thing that I ever did that was smart in my life was fully surrender to the, the will and power of God. The only thing that I ever did. Um, unfortunately, it did take 17 years of hardcore drug addiction to get me to that point, but um, that was the only smart thing I ever did. And now, you know, I plan on spending the rest of my life serving God and, and doing what he would have me do. So I thank you guys for letting us be here. I love each and every one of you. This church is amazing. Pastor, you're, you're awesome. Thank you so much. for. I, it's an honor for you letting us be up here. Thank you so much. I love you guys. God bless you. Uh, we, we go around and share at a lot of different churches and share testimonies and share uh, what our ministry is doing. And uh, as we were uh, scheduling this service and uh, I was praying about what to share. And uh, Saturday night, um, a lot of our guys are out doing the fundraisers that you saw. Um, so there's not many back to share testimonies. Um, but, you know, I wanted to share, have Rex share. And then I want to share a little bit of my story. But um, I was teaching a class the other day. Uh, to our guys, and we were sharing, they were sharing about things they went through and how the enemy uh, has attacked their lives to get them to where they were at. And one of the guys said something, and it, it, it was such a Holy Spirit moment, but he said, um, it seems that Satan, uh, as he was looking around here in the sharing, it seems that Satan has a blueprint 
a pattern that he uses in each person's life to get them to where they're at. And, and I, I started thinking about that, and I was like, you know, we need to know the schemes of the enemy. What is his blueprint? And um, we, we do uh, many different courses, so I'm going to try to take a, a teaching class. It's an 18-week class, and pack it into one message and intertwine it with my testimony. So hopefully you can follow me, and I don't uh, try to share too much. But uh, I think that uh, the Lord has a great message. Uh, can we pray real quick? Father God, as, uh, as I share the message that you've given me, Lord, I just pray that you prepare the hearts of those that need to hear this message, Lord, that, that you free the hearts from bondage, Lord, that you set us free, that you love us so much that no stone remain unturned, Lord. Um, as we conclude this message, Lord, that it not be my impact, but your fingerprints on your loved ones, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Uh, I want to turn to the book of Judges, Judges 6. Everyone's familiar, you guys are in church on Saturday night, so you've got to be familiar with Gideon. If you're on church on Saturday night, you know a little bit of scripture. I'll, I'll give you some of the background, um, Judges 6, Judges 6. Uh, the first uh, verse is, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Uh, basically, Israel at this time didn't have a king. It was under the reign of the judges. And uh, this other country, the Midianites, were just attacking the uh, Israelites. Um, if you go on and read, it says they had to hide in caves in the mountains. Uh, every time that they would come out and they would plant their crops, uh, right at the harvest time, right when they were ready to, to get the the fruit of their labor, the Midianites would come and take it, and uh, they were just ravaged for seven years. Um, in my own life, uh, from my own choices, drug addiction, from choices that weren't my own, my father dying of cancer, uh, my brother dying of an overdose, um, and choices of my own, me uh, choosing to hang around with wrong people and choosing to use drugs, my life was ravaged, and you know, I didn't know left from right. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe you're there right now. You know, your, your life has just been one battle after the next. And every time you feel like you're getting some headway, you, 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 you're about to enjoy the fruit of your labor, and, and that gets taken from you. That, that's where they were at. It was bad. They were hiding out in the caves, and uh, every time um, they, they got something, the Midianites came and took it away. Um, I'm going to jump to verse 7. When the Israelites cried out, so this ver, uh, chapter 6, verse 7, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued, rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat, sat down under the oak that belonged to Joash the Asbarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. How many of you know you don't thresh wheat in a wine press? A wine press is usually underground or in a cave. It's somewhere dark where they leave the wine to ferment. When you thresh wheat, the wheat, the thresher, it has to get thrown up in the air, and, and the part you don't use gets blown away. So you usually do it out in the open in a big area, and usually if you have a lot, you use some kind of animal to, to stomp on it. So, so two things here. He didn't have much wheat because he was doing it on his own, and he was scared because he was down in the, hiding in the wine press. And, and how many of us have been at that point? Where we're, where we're hiding about our faith or we're hiding about what's going on in our life because we've just been, we've just been oppressed, we've been attacked, we, we don't have much hope left. So this, uh, this prophet of the Lord, um, the angel of the Lord in verse 11, uh, came and sat down and, and talked to Gideon. And in verse 13, let me make sure I'm not... Yeah, so let's go to 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. We know right then and there, Gideon didn't 
um, ha- had not shown any evidence of being a mighty warrior from what Scripture tells us, and he didn't feel as if he was a mighty warrior. How many of you, have maybe God has called you something, and you're like, <laughs> wait a minute, you got the wrong person. He's over there. Go next door. God's got the right door, and he's knocking on your heart, and he's calling you a mighty warrior. He's calling you to a mission. He's calling your identity, and he's calling your purpose. And so often, the enemy's tactic is to get us to believe our purpose is something else than it actually is. Uh, Tim, you, you've probably used a jackhammer before. Have you ever used a jackhammer? Gr- great at breaking concrete, right? How well would it work if you had to dig a, 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 a hole in, in dirt? Wouldn't work very well, right? You, right? Uh, but, but that's, we all have a destiny and a purpose called by God. But, but Satan comes and tries to get us twisted and off doing something here on left field. Um, I was reading uh, the story of Moses. And uh, Moses comes to Pharaoh. He throws down his staff, becomes a snake. But what, what happens? Pharaoh's sorcerers, Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing, right? And I was reading a, a study Bible. And this, uh, this theologian or philosopher, whatever, th- um, one of his suggestions was that uh, Possibly those magicians had real snakes that they trained to be still. They were manipulating God's creation. And then you go on, and, and what, what is the next one is he turns the, the Nile into blood. And what do they do? They take little bowls of water, and they turn it red as well. So they manipulated it. And the, the, the frogs, God you know, brings in the plague of frogs, and then they bring in frogs too. But then Moses takes his staff, and he strikes the dust on the ground, and he makes gnats. And it says that the magicians couldn't make the gnats. Well, what did God do when he first created man? He took dust from the ground and he breathed life into it. So right there, pastor, God created gnats. He he created new life at that moment with those gnats. And those magicians could not create. And and God creates. He creates new life in us. When we come become saved, he breathes, and we become a new creation in Christ. But Satan, he cannot create. He may have you believe that he can create, but all he can do is manipulate the creation that God has already made. And so that's what he does. God makes us a a jackhammer, and Satan comes and tries to manipulate us to believe that we're a, a pole digger. And when we're not walking in the calling that God has for us, it, it doesn't work out well. And so uh, let, let's, uh, let's look on in the story of Gideon. So he says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? If God is for me, if I'm a mighty warrior, why am I in this cave threshing only this little bit of wheat? Right? Have you ever felt that way? God, if you're really with me, why is this situation going on? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength, you have, and save Israel out of the Midian's hand. And am I not sending you? So so God said, Go in the strength that you have. But Gideon probably said, I don't have any strength, right? And and that's kind of identified to us if we read on. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength. You have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And uh, how many of you guys have felt, felt that before? Your, your task, and you're just like, how can I do this task, Lord? I'm not equipped. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. How can I minister to my family? How can I minister to that kid in school? How, how can I pray for this person who's sick? How can I emotionally stand strong for my family members when I just want to go in the room and cry? How can, I, how can I go to church and serve the Lord when all this is going on? And, and God told Midian, he said, go in the strength that you have. He had already given him and equipped him with all the tools that he needed. But, but Gideon didn't see it. Because Satan had distorted his, his mindset, his viewpoint, his view on God, and his own identity, his belief about himself. So my first question to you guys is, who are you? 
Who are you? Pastor, if I were to ask you who, who you are, you could say, I'm Pastor Jay, or I'm the pastor of Gateway City Church, but is that who you are? No, right? Or you could say, you could say your job, right? I'm a pastor. You could say, I'm an American. I'm a Floridian. I live in Fort Walton. You could, you know, give your ethnicity. You could give your age, you know, but who we are is, is more than our race. It's more than an American. It's more than our job. It's more than our title. If I cut your arm off, would you not be Pastor Jay without your arm? <laughs> You, you know, you, you, take out, you take out some organs. You might get to you finally, you cut enough away. But, but we are more than, than just these titles. We're more than what we do as a job. We're more than what other people call us. Right? We're more than our denomination or non-denomination. We're more than our, our position in the church. I'm an usher. Right? We're, we're, we're more than that. We're more than our appearance. Your good looks or your not so good looks. You're more than that. <laughs> right? Um, 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, We recognize no man according to the flesh. We get that one messed up, don't we? Uh, I, I think it's uh, fallen nature. You see someone and you're already, you know, you're already making assumptions. Whether you, know, whether you want to or not, it's just, it's... Uh, I think part of our fallen nature, but who you are is determined, is who you are determined by what you do, or is what you do determined by who you are? This is an important question, especially if it relates to Christian maturity. Does, does Christ love you, pastor, because you, you're a pastor and you're serving the church and you're making disciples? Or do you get to make disciples because he loves you? Amen. Pastor, if you were to move up on a mountain and never minister to another person ever again, never see another person, God wouldn't love you any less. Because he doesn't love us based on what we do. Your identity in Christ as a child of God is directly linked to our hope for growth. Our meaning and fulfillment as a Christian is based on the understanding of who you are, based on your identity in Christ. Our growth as a Christian is going to be based on or limited by our understanding of that, of who we are in Christ. So if we think, as, as, as the angel of the Lord said, Gideon, mighty warrior... If he believed he was a mighty warrior, he wouldn't have had to thrown the fleece. You guys know about the fleece, right? He said, well, God, if you're really calling me, let me get a sign. And he threw the fleece, and if the fleece was wet and the ground was dry, then, and then he, God did it. And then he said, wait a minute. Now, if the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, then, you know, he, he asked for a sign, and then he asked for another sign. But if he, if he believed what God said when God said, mighty warrior, and Gideon said, here I am, he wouldn't have had to go on through all those shenanigans. I don't even think God would have had to remove all the soldiers. Because, I, you know, I, I think right then and there, he would have called them and he would have gone. But Gideon didn't believe his identity in Christ. And so many of us don't believe in our identity in Christ. And yes, we have a responsibility, but I, I think a lot of that unbelief comes because Satan has came and manipulated our thought process. He's manipulated what we believe about ourselves, um, and, and it messes us up, right? So the only identity equation that works in God's kingdom, and, and get this, is you plus Christ equals wholeness and meaning. You and Christ, you're, you're whole and meaningful. Nothing else is needed. So you could be strung out on drugs, just like I was, I, uh, my, my oldest daughter is seven now. Uh, I don't have too much clean time. Um, I've been clean seven years. My uh, oldest daughter was born addicted to morphine. I was a pretty crappy person, uh, strung out on drugs. Um, she had to stay in the hospital for about a month and a half and been weaned off. We got her back. I was driving in my car and wanted to go buy some crack. 
have my two-month-year-old daughter who DCF is trying to take away from me in the hood, purchasing crack, not wanting to wait to light up, driving in the car with her in the back. Messed up, tore up. And God chose to redeem me. He chose to redeem me. I, I, sh I don't deserve that. But in that moment, in that horrible moment that, that is very shameful for me, with Christ, I was full and whole right at that moment. No, no less or no more than I am right now. And so it doesn't matter where you're at in life. The things that may have happened either by your choosing or other people doing to you or, or by happenstance, it doesn't matter what's happened to you. With Christ, if you're whole, you have meaning, you have identity. There's nothing else necessary in that mix. But Satan's equation for your identity is your self-worth and people's opinion equals wholeness. But guess what? Even if you're the best at your job, you're not going to be 100% every day. And people are fickle. Even your mama don't like you every day. So if you, if you base your self-worth on, on your performance and others' opinions, you're in a bad spot to get let down over and over again. I was just talking with a pastor the other day. We are having lunch, and he was, just, uh, he was sharing with me. He's like, man, uh, ties weren't coming in, and, and we had all these projects going on, and then we had a, we had a, uh, a flood, uh, flooding that happened, and we had to rip out, and it was about a $100,000 project, and my board came to me, and we're over budget, and I was wanting to do these ministry opportunities. He's like, at that moment, I just, I felt like a failure. I felt like, like man, where, my ministry's going down the hole. And then he said, that next Sunday, someone just uh, wrote a $44,000 check. And then the week after, a $13,000 check. And then we were sitting at lunch, and he got a phone call. And someone said, hey, I have a $35,000 check for you to come get. And in like a two-week period. And, and, and so I'm not saying that to brag on, on the amount of money or anything like that. But so often we base what's going on in our life or in our ministry that God's called us to do based on what's happening. But if we just trust God, he's got it. He's got it. Um, so our performance is not always 100%. People, you know, they're not always going to like us. Um, and, and, and what happens when we base our identity on those two things, false beliefs happen. Because people hurt us. E even the people that really love us hurt us sometimes. False beliefs are based on fear or arise out of loss of pain demean and diminish the value and growth of an individual. Today in this in, uh, society, we are the, uh, we are, there's so much anxiety, there's so much fear. Um, Prozac is just doled out. I mean, it's crazy. Even in the church, there's so much anxiety and so much fear of what's going to happen. And some of you right now, you're, you're worried about the holidays, you're worried about presents, you're worried about family. All stuff that, that if we just abided in Christ, none of that would matter. Um, so I want to talk about false beliefs for a minute because I, I think that is one of Satan's tactics. False beliefs are lies that either uh, ourselves, other people, or Satan tell us. Um, so you have, you have uh, projected lies those are like when your dad or your mom says, oh, you're never going to amount to nothing. You're no good. Or a friend says that. And, and then you have survival lives. Survival lives are things that we tell ourselves to get by. So it's like a little kid, he hurts himself. He, he cries out and, and he's crying out. And, you know, his parents slam the door and say, shut up. Stop being a baby. He's hurt. So he's crying out because he, he wants the love and care of his parents. And when he cries out for the love and care, he, he gets a negative effect. So what's that child going to tell themselves? I don't need anyone. I need to do this on my own. I'm not going to ask for help. And, and many of us have been there. Uh, and it might not have been a big situation. It was just a small situation. But then we, we create that lie right then and there. We do need people because God created us for relationship with others and with him. But Satan distorts us and has us believe that, that we don't need it. 
And so we create this false belief. And then what happens is one of our friends does the same thing. And then Satan comes and speaks in our ear. See, you don't need anyone. See, see, you, you just need to be by yourself. And then the next situation happens. And again, Satan whispers in our ear. So one lie, one instance, then develops a personality. And then we have this personality of, I don't need you. I'm not going to ask for help. And, and I got this. And, and that's a dangerous place to be because as the body of Christ, we need, we need each other. We need to be intimate with each other, not, not on a sexual nature, but on, on an emotional nature, on a spiritual nature. Intimacy, into me you see, meaning I ha have things in my life that someone close to me knows all about, and I know all about theirs, and the same with me and God. And, but but that, that false belief has created a personality where I don't let anyone in, and I've become isolated, and in that Isolation, resentment, anger, bitterness breeds. And, and it distorts who we are in Christ. And we're never going to be able to be the true jackhammer breaking the concrete. We're going to find ourselves as a jackhammer digging in dirt, not getting very far. And you're going to be spinning your wheels and, and never being fulfilled in, in your calling of Christ. So some of these false beliefs, I'm going to name a few. And, and, and I'm going to pray as I name the few that, that some of you may be living with some of these. Um, I, I believe, Pastor, we can be set free, filled with the Spirit, born again, but there can be areas in our lives, the compartments, where we, maybe we haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to get into. And sometimes they're buried so deep we don't even know that they're there. So as I read these, I just pray that, that if, if you're living with some of these, that the Holy Spirit begins to, to reveal and... and, and not to hurt you, but we need to know that, that the infection's there to be able to get it out. And we have to allow the Holy Spirit into these areas. So some of these false beliefs you might be telling yourself is, like the one I just said, I'm all alone. No one cares. I have to take care of myself. You might relate with that one. Or maybe, I don't deserve good things. You feel you need to punish yourself. I'm responsible for other people's feelings, problems, pain, behavior. Do you feel that, that their mess up is your fault? And so you heap condemnation on yourself for someone else's mistakes. I'm a disappointment. I'm a mistake. Oh, that's a lie from the enemy. When bad things happen, it's my fault. Something totally out of your control happens, and you blame yourself. That is a lie. My needs are not important. We know that's a lie. We heard a testimony of God loves this man so much that a $12 concern, God said, I'm going to do an impossible miracle because he loves you. That, 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 that shows that, that God cares about even the small things in our life. That he loves us. He cares about us. Whatever I do, it won't be enough. Wow. That's a big one. My worth is based on how hard I work. If I'm not up and on, on it, if I'm not on the move, I'm not going to survive. If I trust, if I give in to others, I'm going to lose myself. I have to hold back or I won't survive when others leave me. If I get well, something bad will happen. Wow. So we, we don't want healing. We don't want to move on. We don't want victory because we're afraid that next level, something bad, even more bad is going to happen. And it keeps us from our victory. People need me, but I don't need them. There's something wrong with me. If I leave, everything will fall apart. When a man, woman likes or needs me, I have value. So we're only valued when someone else likes us. I am my flaws. People will only like me when I'm happy. All men and women are alike. I'm a gross. That's a lie. God made you beautiful and wonderful. I'll always be alone. God is waiting for me to blow it so he can punish me. Mm. When I really need him, he won't be there. I have to go through things alone to benefit. God will lead me out, drop me off, and leave me there. 
Anything good will be taken away. I'll survive if I'm invincible. I have to do everything right. Being sensitive is bad. If I'm a needy, if I'm needy, men and women will think I'm weak and control me or hurt me. If I show weakness, people will reject me. And there's many more that we can believe. But these are lies that we create, that others create, and the enemies create. And, and it has us living in bondage. It has us not fulfilling the calling of God that he's called us to live. And then what we do is we create protective personalities to protect that weakness, that area. Have you ever said, man, that person just pushed my button? I have. Uh, a preacher I listened to, he says, if you squeezed an orange and apple juice came out, what would we think? That'd be weird. But when a Christian gets squeezed, why is it weird that the fruits of the flesh come out instead of the fruits of the Spirit. As a Christian, we're slaves to Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. So when we, we shouldn't have a button that should be able to be pushed. Love should always come out. But we do. We have these buttons. I have them. And if they, they get pushed wrong, and, and what those are, those are wounds. Those are areas where there's infection. And if you have a button that can get pushed, it's evidence that this message is for you. That there's an infection that needs to be opened up and it needs to be removed. And, and, and how many knows when you have to open up a wound, it can be painful. And so to visit these memories, even when I started listing them, oh, you might have, it might have started to hurt. There might have been pain that came up. And we just try to suppress them and not deal with them. Oh, well, Christ is, yeah, he has delivered you. But sometimes to get full healing, to, to be able to 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 talk about it and to be used by Christ by it, we have to revisit those areas to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and heal those areas. So I'm going to, real quickly, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to name some of our protective personalities, things that we, uh, personalities that we create to protect these wounds in our lives. And we all probably will uh, identify with one or two or many. I know I got a lot of them. Let me find where I got them. All right, so these are protective personalities, things, uh, a personality that we create to protect our wounds. And, and the first one is the doormat. You just let people do whatever they want, say whatever they want. Oh, that doesn't bother me. It's okay. Oh, they didn't mean it. And, and, and it might look like a real loving personality to take, but really in the inside you're screaming and you're hurt and, and resentment is building the doormat. The hero. You have the answer for everything, and I'm going to go through these quickly. The martyr. It's your job to fix everything. You, you have to sacrifice. Oh, man, they messed up at work, and, and it's going to take hours. I'm going to stay overnight for the next two weeks to fix the problem. And it wasn't even your responsibility. But you, you have the need to be the martyr or the hero. Mr. or Mrs. Nice, the phony, the pleaser, the rescuer, Mr. or Mrs. Right, the super servant, the overachiever, don't mess with me, mm -mm. the actor, maybe blank, nothing bothers you, you just stonewall, and you don't let anyone in. Confusion, confusion can be a protective personality. If you don't know what's going on, well, I don't know what's going on, so I, I'm not responsible for it. That's a protective personality, y'all. Invincible. I'm okay. It's all good. The wall. Numb. Overwhelmed. The perfectionist. I know I got some of you there. Lazy. Lazy. The Pharisee. Hard worker. I'm just in your work all the time. Don't deal with nothing outside of work. Anger. That's me there. The bully, maybe you're just mean. Contempt, control, crazy. The critic, the protector, 
independence, the scapegoat, the victim, the loser. Pastor, do, do I have freedom to do something real quick? All right. So I, I would do an altar call right now and call all of you up that identified with that, but most of you wouldn't come up because you don't want no one to know what your protective personalities are, but everyone already knows what they are because you show them every day. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to invite the Holy Spirit in right now. I want everyone to close their eyes, get real comfortable, relax your shoulders. And, and I want you to just allow the Holy Spirit in your mind to reveal the truth to you. So I want you to, first I want you to name your protective personality. Which one is you? There might be several, but you got one. All right, you got it. I want, I want you to ask the protective personality how long he's been there. How long has he been there? I want you to ask him, why is he there? What is he protecting you from? Or another question, if he wasn't there, what emotion or hurt would you feel? He's protected you from a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. So I want, you to, I want you to thank him real quick. Thank you for protecting me these years. Now I want you to ask this protective personality if he would be willing to allow Christ to step in and protect you from now on. Ask him. Now I want you to ask Christ to come in and protect you instead. Lord Jesus, I just pray as we invite you in to protect us and we, we ask these protective personalities to, to remove out that you protect these wounds, that you heal these wounds, these areas in our lives that, that there's so much emotional hurt and pain and sensitivity, Lord. But we trust that you're a good, good father and that you love us and that you are the best person to protect these areas in our life. And, and we right now surrender these areas to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so that was step one. I had to get, get your protective personalities down because your guards would have been up. Now that I got some of your guards down, we can, we can do, allow the Holy Spirit to do a little bit more work. So those false beliefs that we were talking about earlier, the ones that I'm a loser, I'm a loner. The, the protective personality was protecting us from those. So I want to do one more, one more uh, exercise in allowing the Holy Spirit to come in. So if you guys close your eyes again. And I want you to try to identify a false belief in your life. One that just, when I said it just was like, wow, that really resounds in me. And I'll, I'll, I'll read some of them real quick again. I'm a loser. I'm not worth anything. I'm only worth what, what I do. I, 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 I'm, no one is ever going to love me. Read a couple more here. I'll always be alone. God is waiting for me to blow it so he can punish me. There's something wrong with me. My worth is based on how hard I work. My needs are not important. I'm a disappointment. I don't deserve good things. I'm all alone. No one cares. So I want you to find which one is yours. And I want you right now, I want you to say it. Say it, I feel like I'm not worth anything. Now I want you to say it to Jesus. Jesus I feel that I'm not worth anything. Holy Spirit, I just ask right now, you've heard what your people believe about themselves, this lie. Please, right now, I invite you to tell them the truth about who they are and what you think about them.
Holy Spirit, if there's anything else you want to show them, do it now. Father God, I just again, I just pray that you heal these wounds, these lies that are from the pit of the enemy. We speak truth right now to them. We are more than conquerors. We are loved by you. We are created valuable and worthy in your eyes. I just pray that you heal these wounds, that you seal them, that you protect them. And right now, any demonic influence has to go in the name of Jesus, that they go to the place that you prepare for them right now to never attack these wounds again. We pray that you seal them by your power, your love, in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. So some of you didn't let your guard down and you think I'm a weirdo. Some of you did and the Holy Spirit just did some surgery on you. I'm praying that some of you allowed him in and that he will continue to rock your world because he will if you allow him to. I'm wrapping up, I promise. All right, so what we believe, guys, is so powerful. Did you guys see on Facebook uh, maybe a couple weeks or a month ago, there was this lady, she got a package in the mail, and she opened it up, and she thought it was a bomb. Did any one of you see that on Facebook? It went viral. Well, she opened this package up. She thought it was a bomb. She was alone. Her husband was uh, military, but he wasn't there. He, she couldn't get her on the phone. It was late at night, I think 2 or 3 in the morning. She ran upstairs, grabbed her sleeping kids, threw them over the shoulders, couldn't grab the dogs because she had her kids, ran out, ran next door, and called the cops. The cops came in. They opened it up. They came out, and they laughed. It was a dryer motor. It was a dryer motor. Harmless. But it didn't matter because she believed that it was harmful to her and to her household. So she reacted on the belief. It didn't matter if it was true. It mattered what she believed. Our, our belief system is so powerful, we could know something's not true, but we could feel that it's true in our mind that we still react. Um, I can prove it to you. Have you ever been to a haunted house? I hate haunted houses. I think they're from the devil. But if you've ever been to one... <laughs> it's okay. I'm not condemning you. If, if you've ever been to one, it's okay. Maybe you still do. But you, you, when you go into the haunted house, you know the man coming at you with the chainsaw is fake. You know in your mind it's not going to hurt you. You know it. There, there's nothing that's going to actually hurt you. But that knowing doesn't change your reaction of what you feel when he comes at you. Wow. So that's that means when we read scripture and we say, this is good, and we hear pastor, and this is good, and then the situation arises, and, and even though we know the truth, our feeling causes us to react differently. We know that we shouldn't have premarital sex, but when our feelings say, I love this person, even though we know the truth is to not get in bed, we find ourselves in bed. Why? What's going on there? Yeah, we're, we're sinners. Absolutely. We're sinners. And, and, and we have to experience the new restoration power of Christ in our lives, right? We have to have reborn resurrection power come in, right? And, and, and sometimes, even as new resurrection power, we still find ourselves falling short. Right? Because the lies of the enemy keep saying, you're not going to amount to nothing. You're, and we aren't. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm a drug addict. I'm a horrible person. I'm, you know, I, I amount to nothing. But in Christ, I'm everything. In Christ, you guys are everything. <laughs> the enemy takes our experiences and lies to us. He gets us to believe that an event or something that we've done or that has been done to us determines who we are. So since I use drugs, I'm a drug addict. Or since I've stolen something, I'm a thief. Maybe something terrible's happened to you. Maybe you did something bad. 
Maybe something bad's been done. Maybe something horrible. Rape. Divorce. Death. That's horrible stuff, but God knows about it. And he desires you to live a life beyond that, here and now, not just in heaven. And so often we get so stuck in the pain and the false beliefs and the misery of things that have happened that we never experienced the life that God has intended us past those events. And I, I'm... Please, if something like that has happened to you, I'm not, I'm not knocking the severity or the pain of that situation. But God intends you to, you to have life beyond that situation. And if, if we don't move past it, then you're going to continue to experience something horrible that God never intended for you to experience. We are no longer products of our past. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, we are new creations in Christ, right? You did not receive a spirit of slavery that returns you to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Amen. Psalms 139. 23 and 24. This is David. David slept with Bathsheba, killed her husband, took her as his own, did horrible things, denied it, and finally God exposes his sin. He didn't expose it himself. The prophet Nathan had to go to him and accuse him. So God loved him so much to to get him to expose it. And that's what we're doing here. We're trying to not only expose sin, but also expose other people's sin to us and the fall, all, all the nonsense that happens to us. And when it got exposed, David said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me. He lead me in the way everlasting. Pastor, would it be appropriate to have the worship team come up? You guys could come up and strum some chords. At six years old, um, my dad was an alcoholic before I was born. He got radically saved. Um, very, very poor. Um, finally uh, got a construction business, got a, a GM license, and started everything started going good for our family. Um, and then when I was six, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, believed in God, believed in healing. He told me and my two older brothers, don't worry, God's going to heal me. I was still really young. Um, in about five months, he died. Um, both of my brothers got really angry at God. I got angry at God. I didn't really know what I was because I was so young, but I kind of followed after what they were doing. Um, they got into drugs and gangs, and I, I followed suit, smoked my first joint at 8, started using cocaine and pot at, at 11, hanging out with older people. Uh, by the time I was 16, my middle brother, who was the one I kind of looked up to, overdosed and died. He was living a gang lifestyle. I started hanging out with all of his friends just trying to get my identity everywhere and anywhere. At the age of 11, a 15-year-old uh, boy talked me into a homosexual act, and that tore me up. I started sleeping with any woman I could, and the devil just distorted my life so bad that I didn't know who I was, where I was, or what I was. But then God. I wanted to kill myself and end my life. But a praying mom was on her knees praying for her son. And instead of ending my life, I cried out. And I, and I cried out to God, and he met me right there. And some of you, this, this message, the Holy Spirit is tugging on you. Maybe, maybe you, did, you, you thought the exercises, you didn't let the Holy Spirit in there. Maybe you did. Maybe he's speaking to you. 
But I want to give you one last opportunity. If you guys could stand to your feet. Maybe you're playing Christianity. But you've never fully surrendered. And you've never really been born again. Maybe you, you, you've given your life to Christ, but there's some areas you withhold, some areas that you never let the Holy Spirit in. Maybe you're struggling with some of these false beliefs, some of these protective personalities. And to be used fully by God, He needs to remove those buttons. He needs to heal those areas. If that's you, if the Holy Spirit's tugging at you, not that this front area is any more holy than the area you're in, but I think it's a sign of saying, Lord, I surrender, and I want everyone to know it. Do a work in me. If that's you, I just please come up for prayer. invite you if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me. The message that uh, Brother Rico was just used of the Holy Spirit to give is very important in this moment. The reason for it is because as he said the enemy will he will manipulate our beliefs to dictate what we perceive. When the enemy manipulates our beliefs to dictate what we see, we'll always see the lie that he wants us to see. But then God. See, the wonderful thing about what God does is he comes in and he speaks into our lives what he sees but we're unable to see yet when God came to Gideon he said you valiant warrior well God saw a valiant warrior where Gideon saw a fearful man but God has begun to speak to that part of us that's hidden beneath the lie and I love the song that Leah sang earlier and we're about to sing together again because in that, in that song, he took us out of darkness and he stripped, he removed the lie. <laughs> God removes the lie when he speaks the truth to who we are and he calls it forth. Some of us need God to speak to the truth of who we are and I want to just invite you if you if you don't know Jesus if you've never called upon him as your Lord and Savior in fact with heads bowed and eyes closed let me just ask this question if you're standing here in this moment and you've never called on the name of Jesus and he's not right there in your life and you're in relationship with him I, right where you're standing I want you just to lift your hand that's you in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Those of us gathered in this moment who know Jesus, but the enemy has been manipulating our beliefs to dictate our perceptions of who we are and the life that we're living. And you need... You need the lie to be stripped away. And you need to see what God sees. To begin to see your life as God sees it in Christ. To see your life as God sees it in Christ. As we begin to sing this song, if you're, if you're here and that's you, I, I want you to join these who are standing up here. 
And I'm going to ask Brother Rico, Tim, if you and Galen, uh, if you guys would just come help me pray and minister to these who are standing up here. But if that's you, I want you to come down here as we begin to sing this song. I belong to you, Jesus. I need to be reminded I belong to you. What I have, the enemy cannot take. Who I am, he cannot change. I belong to you. If that's you, you need to come up here, make your way up here right now. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Know the enemy. 
you would just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Father, the word you've spoken, the truth you've declared. Father, I thank you that even now it is being sealed upon us by the power and person of your Holy Spirit. Accomplishing the work of your will in us. Producing in us and through us the perfect result. Not returning to you void. Completing and fulfilling in every way what you have sent it forth to accomplish. I thank you, Father, that not only will the hearts of each and every one of us receive by faith the truth you've declared, but Father, I thank you that our minds and the memories of our minds will not neglect or forget the truth you have spoken. So that our minds are renewed, so that, Lord, the perception we have is based on the truth of your word, not the lie of the enemy. Father, we thank you for it. We embrace it. We receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. What we're going to do is we're going to dismiss. If you want to go, you can go in just, in just a moment. Ushers are in the back. I encourage you, if you can, to sow into this ministry, Project Hope. Again, there are things in the back. They're, they'll be there if you want to purchase any of those things they have back there. Feel free to pick those up. Though we'll be dismissing, that doesn't mean that you have to go. We have this standing policy here at Gateway in the living room. We'll hang out as long as you want to hang out. We'll minister as long as the Holy Spirit is moving. And as long as we're here, He's moving. So if you haven't yet come up and you want prayer, Come up, let us know. I'm here. Tim, Galen, Sheila, Tanya. We're up here to minister if that's what you need. I'm going to say this before I dismiss this. I want you to listen to me. Take, turn the volume of the worship team down just a minute because I want to make sure you hear this. God is speaking a prophetic word that is awakening the divine destiny that has been assigned to your life. Now I'm going to tell you this. We have a choice. We have a choice to give ear to the prophetic word that God's assigned to the divine destiny in our life or excuse ourselves from accepting it. I'm declaring over this house that we will, we will choose to be those who embrace it, accept it, and run with it. God is not looking for your perfection. He is looking for your humiliation. That you will humble yourself and receive unto yourself the grace that he has caused to abound to you. There is nothing that you and I have been called to do that we have been, we've been qualified in our ability to do. It is the grace of God. It is the grace of God. And I'm here to tell you, it's time to let these things be awakened in us. They've been asleep way too long. They've been asleep way too long. It's time that they get awakened. 
And those of us who've said to ourselves, well, no, this is my, this is my rest period. Get over it. This is not rest time. This is not rest time. The destiny of God in you and I to advance his kingdom requires labor. It requires labor. The harvest is ready. It's the laborers that are few. Pray and call out to the Lord of the harvest that he may send the laborers out. I'm here to tell you it's time to work. Amen. I bless you all in the name of Jesus. Have a blessed and prosperous week in Christ Jesus. I look forward to seeing you next Saturday as I continue the message series, When Love is Born. And uh, so I'll see you all next week. 1.30, play practice tomorrow. Be here. Play practice tomorrow, 1.30. Worship team, if you want to stay, you still need ministry, come forward. If you need to leave, go in the peace of the Lord. I love you. We'll see you next week. So wonderful is your unfailing love. The cross was spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. Glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful world, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul, my heart sings. Powerful, so powerful, the glory fills the sky. The mighty works displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty. Awakes my heart to sing Marvelous, how wonderful you are Beautiful world